I want to welcome the entire Grow family and our Grow family all across the world. Welcome. We pray that you leave today challenged and changed because of the power of the Word of God. From the moment you step in to the moment you leave, it is a house of prayer and praise and preaching. To show them His love, tell them His truth, teach them His ways. We begin today with the privilege of sharing the best story in the world that changes lives, the gospel of Jesus Christ, amen? The gospel of Jesus Christ. This gospel message has changed lives throughout the centuries. It has changed your life and mine. Many of us have testimonies of what the Lord has done in our lives, has saved us from sordid pasts, Stories that we never thought were full of redemption. The gospel is powerful. And it is why the Lord established his church to share these words, John 3, 16. For this is how God loved the world. He gave his one and only son. So that everyone who believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Those words have been heard and spoken and preached about so many times. And it has fallen on the ears of some people over and over and over and over again. Some people grip this truth immediately. Some heard it and considered its teachings and walked away. Some of those people who walked away heard the gospel and eventually came to Christ and then they spend their life looking back, thanking God that he restored and protected their lives so that they could have life to receive the gospel. The book of Ephesians says that before we accept Christ, we have no idea how close we are to be recipients of his wrath. We are children of wrath, and we have no idea that his wrath is, is so close to our hearts. We walk in this world, and we have this unawareness or self-confidence that life is okay, and we have political peace and economic peace and familial peace and social peace and peace of all kinds, but there are people that walk around this world today that are not certain that they have peace with God. It has been a great privilege to be able to share this gospel message every single time we gather. This story changes lives. This truth changes lives. If you have accepted Jesus Christ, I want you to reflect on the time that he saved your soul. Because that is the greatest doxology. The fact that you live out a life transformed. And the fact that you live a life change when people see how you were before and how you are now. And people scratch their heads and say, how did you do it? What happened? And you say, not I, but Christ. Not I, but Christ. And we are walking doxologies of his glory because only God can change a life. The gospel story is the most beautiful story that a believer has the privilege of sharing. And I'd like the privilege of sharing it with you. If you are here today and you have never accepted Christ as your savior, I want you to hear these words. God created everything and it was beautiful. He then created humankind and said it was his best creation of all. And humankind had his image, man and woman. And they walked in the peaceful environment of the garden. Mankind actually communed with his creator. And they enjoyed this relationship. As man worked, God and man were all right. The man was put to a test to see if he would make the conscious choice of obeying the Creator. Man in his heart 
chose to disobey God. As soon as that happened, introduced into humankind was a tarnish of sin. A sin element was introduced into the human race and it infused and infiltrated every part of his being, his thinking, his heart, his emotions, his will was now at odds with the Holy Creator. Immediately, man, for the first time, began to hide from God, try to hide away, and then attempted to lie and explain away his sinful choice, play the blame game, and, and there was no more peaceful relationship with their Creator. It had a great consequence to humankind. Because from that moment, every man, woman, boy, or girl had this tarnish of sin in their soul. And throughout the centuries, people have attempted to wash this away. They just can't get to the essence of their sinfulness. Sometimes they come to church. Sometimes they give charitable things and they do good in society and and they gauge the better than, I'm better than this person, or, and, and in society, you probably are. But in God's eyes, he looks down on this world and sees two types of people. A person that is, has asked the Lord to forgive them of their sin and save them, and a person who is not. And they try to clean up their act, and reverence Christ during Easter and Christmas. They try to respect the church. But nothing humans have done in their lifetime have been able to wash this sinfulness away. The scriptures say that a holy God is unable to have that peaceful relationship with sin. And as long as this tarnish of sin is true and alive in our hearts, there is no way that we can once again have peace with God. And that's where man is. It's a hopeless state. There is nothing you can do, nothing you can say, nothing that you can act, nothing you can commit to that will wash your heart whiter than snow. There is nothing, nothing you can do it's at this part of the story that the listener needs to just pause on and let that sink in. You have no hope to be saved. There is nothing you can do to gain salvation. It is impossible for you to gain eternal life. And that's where every man woman, boy, girl, stands. The scriptures say that there is only one way to get your sinfulness forgiven, and that is to do what Matthew 5, 3 says, to recognize that you are poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. You first have to acknowledge that you are in that spiritually hopeless state. You are unable to do anything. And you realize that you need a mankind to forgive man's sins, but all mankind are sinners. There's no human representative that can step in and pay for your sin and take your punishment and no human, mere human being is able to soak up the judgment of God on that sin because it must be judged. Only someone that's pure and holy can. Only someone that's perfect, holy, righteous, and pure can save you. But no man is. Man must forgive man's sins, but no man is. Only God is perfect, so Mankind needed a God-man. You hear that? A God-man to come and enter this world 
to forgive us of our sins. And that's exactly what God did. God incarnate wrapped himself in flesh. The holy, righteous God came to this earth to live a perfect life, a sinless life. He interacted with his creation. He told him he was God. He told him that he's going to go to the cross and soak up the wrath of the Father and take all the punishment that every man, woman, boy, or girl deserves. And some of them mocked him. The scriptures say he came to his own and his own received him not. But then John 1 says, the end of the verse, but there were a few that had believed in him and to them he gave the authority to become children of God. God, we named him Jesus while he was here, went on the cross. He died on the cross to pay all of our sin payment. Three days later, Jesus rose again. Amen. He rose again, conquering sin, hell, death, and confirming that his words and his promise was true, and he was able to do it. And when he rose again, it did not save anybody. It simply made the salvation offer available. Romans chapter 10, verse 13. For whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved forever. Their lives will be changed. Put your name in place of everyone. For if I call upon the name of the Lord, I will be saved. No matter your past, no matter the horrible things you've done, no matter even if you didn't grow up in a context that you were brought up and nurtured by these truths. I'll never forget talking to a man that said, I am outside of God's reach. God can't save me, literally. I had never experienced that before in my life. How can someone get to the point of believing that God can't save them? He had a rough life. No father figure, no real maternal support at home. He was dealt with in such a way you would never wish anyone to be dealt with. He goes, I don't know what love is. I am out of God's reach. And I remember sitting there as a young minister, not having the answers to say at that moment because you feel you just have to know what to say. And then all of a sudden, as we sat what seemed to be like for a year in silence, just looking at him, the 20-something-year-old man just sobbing in front of me. I began to pray, Lord, speak to me, tell me, tell me. What do you say to this? I've never experienced this. I don't even, what do you say? And I could hear the Lord speak to me scriptures that I learned from kindergarten. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. How precious are thy thoughts unto me, O God, how great are the sum of them. If I should count them, they're more in number than the sand. Romans 5, 8, but God demonstrated his love for us in that while we were still sinners and had no clue we were, he loved us. He loved you at creation. You're the most beautiful creation. He loved you when he died on the cross. He loved you when you didn't even know you needed his love. And his thoughts are so precious. And all I could blurt out to him, I, I, I said, God doesn't love you. I said, I said, you have no choice. He goes, what? I said, you have no choice. God already loves you. 
When you were born, he loved you. He thought when you were, he was knitting you together in your mother's womb, he loved you. When he created all of mankind, he loved you. And he died on the cross before you were ever born, and he loved you. And when you didn't even have a clue that you needed his love, he loves you. And how precious are his thoughts right now upon you, how great are the sum of them, you should count them. They're more in number than the sand. And I said, so too late, he already loves you. A 26-year-old man got off his chair, knelt on the carpet, and accepted Christ as a savior. And I hugged him as if he were my physical brother, saying, God, thank you so much for letting me see a miracle happen right in front of my eyes. Today, from what I understand, he has a family of two, and he is working in the medical field, and the Lord has changed his life. I'll never forget that I met him probably a decade later. I was, I was walking in this hospital, making a call, and I turned, and I almost bumped into him, and we took a couple steps back, and I just said, how are you doing? And he says, everything is great. And the smile on his face was so wonderful. God can change a life. Look at John 3, 16 again. This truth changes lives. For this is how God loved the world, that he gave his one and only son, that everyone who believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. This changes lives, folks. And if we are allowed to speak one sentence in our lives... No matter where we go in this world or what we do, it should be this truth. It changes lives. That's why the church of Christ exists. That's why we as believers walk on this world. The gospel is all about what Christ has done. What all that Christ has done. Man does not contribute to his salvation, nor can man boast about anything. For by grace are you saved through faith, yet not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of any work you've done, lest you boast that you've done anything else. Never, ever get over your salvation. Never get over your salvation. Because in salvation, grace and mercy is at the heart of his kingdom. And he takes you where you're at, and he gives you a new path. The beautiful thing about God's forgiveness is that when you confess your sin, he's faithful and just to forgive you of your sin and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. He does not call on an unbeliever to make up for lost time. Isn't that amazing? The grace of God enters a life unlike any other human form of forgiveness. And he allows someone to stand and hold the oracles of God in his mouth or her mouth. And to share the truth that if God can save me, he can save you too. Have you accepted Christ today? Have you accepted Christ as your Savior? Because your life changed after salvation is the biggest doxa, the biggest doxology that the world will ever see. And they will walk right by a pastor and come straight to you and say, what was it that changed your life? God saves a soul. Without a show of hands, I'd like you to ask yourself, how many times did you hear the gospel before you accepted? Some of you might have heard it as a child, but I suspect some of you have heard the gospel over and over and over again. Praise be to God that he kept life in your lungs and sustained you to be able to hear the gospel truth. And for those of you that have not accepted Christ, he is sustaining you one more day to accept this truth. Today is the day of salvation. Now is the appointed time. Do not let me finish my next sentence without you, just in the quietness of your heart, wherever you are in the world, just say, Lord Jesus, forgive me of my sin. I know that I'm a sinner. 
I know that it's my fault. I know that like mankind, I have sinfulness that I can't wash away. I know that it's my fault and I know that I deserve punishment. But I believe you, God, came to earth named Jesus. I believe you lived a sinless life, a perfect life. I believe you died on the cross. I believe you rose again from the dead. And with my mouth, I confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Please, Lord, save me. Today, if your heart expressed that to God, you are a child of God, not just a creation of God, but you are a glorious child of God and will forever be his child now and with your heavenly Father forever and ever and ever. Amen. We as ministers live to share that gospel. And I pray you as a child of God, live to share that gospel. That is what the Church of Christ is all about. That is why we exist. The church does not exist for any other reason but to reach the world for Jesus, to show them his love, tell them his truth, teach them his ways. It's all about Christ, folks. It's all about the gospel. In this church and any other church, we should never make it anything about Christ. God gets all the glory for what he has done here. It's about Christ. It's never about one person in his church. It's not about me. It's not about you. It's not about anyone. It's not about anyone that gives, the biggest donor. It's not about anyone that serves or has accolades or things named after them. It is all about Christ. God has added many new families to this church over the last few years, many individuals to our church family. It has been exhilarating to talk with you as you explain that you saw what God is doing here. You sensed the spirit of the living God was directing our worship, was directing our time in God's word, was directing our hearts that were controlled by the spirit. You resonated with that. You saw what Grove is, that God was doing a lot. And he has done a lot to get us to this point. And I praise the Lord for what he has done. We often say in this church, to God be the glory great thing he has done and is doing and I am so glad he has when you see spiritual miracles in front of your eyes in the church of God you must give him all glory and all praise the scriptures say that the Lord's ways are not our ways and his ways are higher But never forget all this series of collection of messages on docs that we have been talking about how God is a perfect God and perfect in all of his ways. He never wishes ill will upon any of his children. He is righteous in all of his ways. As Proverbs 16, 9, he says, man makes his plans, but I very lovingly and righteously direct the steps. God is in full control and he knows what he's doing. Many of us have been involved in churches of all types. We have seen the different ebbs and flows of different churches, and you can go across the country, and they're much different. I remember ministering in Florida, and they, uh, one of the challenges on the Sunday night service was vacuuming up the sand. Because in Florida, you're surfing on the beach between services, and that's just how that church is. It's wonderful. I know a church that prefers often to meet outside because they just have the environment by which that's a rich time for them to worship under God's creation. I know a lot of churches, and so do you. Every church is unique. And the Lord, like his children, know every church. And every church that proclaims that gospel is the one that Lord uses and blesses. But God has a unique plan for each church. And his plan is perfect it is perfect here at this church we spent a few years revitalizing it when you revitalize a church there are ways in which God approaches it God usually 
empowers one leader to lay a solid foundation. He often brings one to build upon it. Think of it as a land developer and folks that buy parcels of land and they do all the work that's needed and it's, it's, it's underground usually. It's, uh, it's difficult to plow and tap into all the lines and, and to get everything ready and then land developers have a choice to build on it or they hand it to a builder. But the best land developer is able to hand over a foundation that a builder can immediately build upon it. Immediately. When you're called by God to develop the foundation, you must have courage. You must obey the commands of God upon your life. You must be committed to doing hard work. You must trust Him no matter what. You must obey Him no matter the cost, and your entire family should be committed to such a calling. Both seasons and both foundations and buildings have their challenges and their rewarding seasons. When you lay a foundation, you go through a rough season of tilling ground, removing rocks out of the soil, creating a ground for which the Lord can do his perfect work by growing the flock. It prepares for another to build. The Lord has affirmed in mine and Tammy's spirit that our role at Grove was indeed to lay a solid foundation to prepare for the next man of God to build upon it. This solid foundation is a philosophy of ministry that has been established and that we have seen the Lord bless. We have established our mission that church is not about us, that we reach the world for Jesus to show them his love, tell them his truth, and teach him his ways. We have a conviction of unity, humility, and selflessness. We have a conviction that in this worship experience, it's all about prayer, praise, preaching. We've established a foundation that we must remain nimble, flexible, agile to run to the center of God's activity. We established a foundation that our worship should be without reservation, without restraint, without regret. And that we always, always, always look outward rather than inward because this gospel message and this ministry is all about souls, all about souls. And we believe through fasting and prayer that the Lord has affirmed in our spirits that our role at Grove is to have laid this foundation and do everything we can to make it conducive for the next man of God to build and build immediately upon it. I know this is for some emotionally difficult, and in a way, that's a good thing. Because that means we've cared for each other. If this were easy to do, probably our hearts wouldn't have been in it. But we've loved you. We care for you. You've cared for us. You've cared for this church. We've loved you, every single person. Our heart was invested. And I'm glad it's somewhat difficult. Because that means our hearts were invested. But, hear me on this, if we are called by God, like we have preached for the last three years and eight months, to trust God no matter what, then we must trust God in the easy moments of life, and we must trust him in the challenging ones. We have preached it. We must now live it. God's ways are perfect, and we must trust him no matter what what? God's way. God's way. God's way. God's way. God's way is the best way. God will bless a church that points everyone to what he has done. What he has done. Christ, our firm foundation. Rains came. Winds blew. But our house was built on him. I praise God for the foundation that he's led and that he's laid. It's evidenced by the fact that Grove, God is drawing to Grove the world to hear the gospel. Don't ever lose that passion about sharing the gospel. He has brought different and diverse people here. 
different ethnicities, nationalities, racial diversity, socioeconomic backgrounds. He's brought all ages to be part of the body of Christ. Single moms, accomplished doctorates, college athletes, international visitors, drawn all by the mission and our example of living out the mind of Christ, of telling, showing the love, telling his true, teaching his ways. He has brought a single professional, single business franchisees, moms with their mothers, with a grandchild, experienced educators, students of all majors and disciplines of areas of study, precious widows and widowers, every tribe and nation, diversity, ethnicities, Grove right now, right now is a true cross section of the community that is all around us. And may I also add, it is a beautiful testimony of what heaven will be like. All nations and tribes, all tongues and nations, And I look around this beautiful room and I love the beautiful diversity. God has brought the world here. And in addition to that, in addition to what God has done in bringing you here, I have to tell you that one of the most astounding miracles out of all the spiritual miracles that I have witnessed as your pastor is the following. I am astonished. I am astonished by how the unsaved world has watched us come into this building, hear that we preach the truth of the gospel of who can inherit the kingdom of heaven and not. They're deep into their sin alternative lifestyles, whatever their sin, whatever their bent, whatever their vices. And they have literally said to me, this place is a place of joy and the spirit that I can't even describe. I've never seen it anywhere else. And then they ask, would you accept us? Because they know our clear position on truth. And they want, though, the joy that you experience in this house because of the Holy Spirit every week. They want it, but they're not willing to give up their lifestyle. So they actually ask me to maybe, maybe we'll make an exception. They want what is in this house so badly. I'll never forget a, a man who, who asks, he says, I want to bring my husband next week, but will we, will we be able to enjoy this? Because this is, and he looks around, he goes, because this is a church I have never experienced before. And he had just heard me say that those in certain situations and those who make life's choices and those that stick with this type of sin without conviction will not inherit the kingdom of God. There's a woman who didn't want to give up her alternative lifestyle and says, I love it. But then again, I also feel guilty because I am unwilling to give up my life. And they said, I regret that I cannot come to Grove because of your position. Oh, but how I wish I could. I am astonished that the world sees what the spirit-controlled love and joy is with a diverse group of people, and they hear the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ and how you must forsake and confess your sin, and people are at the door wanting it so badly. I am astonished that they want it so badly that we're preaching the truth against the sin they have chosen, and they still want to get in here. And in every conversation, I'd have the glorious, tender privilege of sharing them why we must maintain a certain standard and I share them the gospel and I tell them how they will know there's a sign in their life they will have accepted the gospel and I've invited people of all types of walks of life to come into my office or to meet me somewhere and talk to me and unfortunately none of them have returned because they don't want to give up their sin. But again, the most astonishing miracle God has done over the last few years is that the watching world has seen the church worship the King of kings and Lord of lords and has asked the Holy Spirit to just let their worship be free and they come in, confess of their sin to worship, and the world sees something they want. I am astonished by that miracle. That shows you the power of God when you do church God's way. God has laid a beautiful foundation. We must give him glory. Let me say it again, and I'll say it again later. 
It has been God that has done this. It has been God, not man, not me. It has been all God. He will continue to do it here at this church if we put aside any self-centered motives, if we put aside our preferences, and we commit to one thing. God, whatever you want in this church, I will do. I abandon my preferences. I lay down my will. Not my will, but yours be done, O oh Lord. If Joe Grove Church does this, it will not just survive, it will thrive. And not just transfer into the next season, it will commence into the next season of ministry for God's glory. Listen to the scriptures of how God will bless a church that has this mindset. Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 and following. Is there any encouragement from belonging to Christ? Of course there is. Is there comfort from his love? Yes, the world sees it all the time. Do you have fellowship together because of the Spirit? Yes, that's exactly what the world notices. Are your hearts made tender and compassionate because he saved your soul? Yes. Then make me truly happy by agreeing wholeheartedly with each other, loving one another, working together with one mind and one purpose. Unity. Verse 3. Humility. Don't be selfish. Don't try to impress others. Be humble, thinking of others as better than yourself. Humility in verse 4, selflessness. Don't look out only for your own interests, but also on the interest of others. Selflessness. Verse 5, you must have the same attitude that Christ had. Unity, humility, and selflessness. Listen to how God receives great glory. Verse 6, God, when he came to this earth, did not think of having equality with God was something he had to cling on to because he was already God. Instead, he gave up his divine privileges and took a humble position of a slave and was born as a human being. But when he, and then he appeared in human form, he humbled himself in obedience to God and died a criminal's death on the cross. But the more we exalt him and because of his sacrifice, listen to verse 9, 10, and 11, the greatest doxology, one of the greatest songs that were sung in the Christian church. Verse 9, because God is so great and you draw all men to him, therefore God elevated Jesus Christ to the place of highest honor and given him a name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow of heaven and earth and on the earth, and every tongue should declare Every tongue should declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every tongue should confess, never ceasing to declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. You continue doing that wherever you are as a child of God, and you will usher all glory to God. Every knee will bow. Work hard to make sure that every knee bows now. There will be a day in glory where every man, woman, boy, or girl will sit in front and stand in front of the throne of God. And they all will acknowledge who he is there. Our goal as children of God is to share the gospel, to show them his love, tell them his truth, teach them his ways, and make sure they take a knee right now. Right now. Every tongue Declare that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. It's all about Christ. Church, folks, is so simple. Make it about Christ. You can have plans, you can have methods, you can be prepared, you can make it about Christ, and the Lord will be glorified. It's not about me. It's never about a person. It's never about any persons. It's never about any preferences. It's not about Ben, Tammy, any of you. No offense. It's not about you. It's not about me. Exalt Christ and watch him do miracles in front of your eyes. And this will, I know, be a house that exalts Christ and Christ alone our hope is found. Philippians chapter 2, verse 12 and 13. Dear friends, you've always followed my instructions when I was with you. 
but now that I'm away. It is even more important. Work hard, work hard to show the results of your salvation. Obey God with deep reverence and fear. For God is working in you, giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Let this season of foundation laying motivate you now to build. Never cease building. Don't even look on this past season as something to adore and admire. And while the scriptures always remember the faithful steps that have been taken in the miracles of God, look at what God has done. Don't look at someone else. Don't say, don't look, because tomorrow this season is in the past. Don't let the past be motivated by what God has done, what he's done, what he's done, and then expect great things from him in the future. Some of you, I'm your first pastor here, and I want to speak to you for a moment. Some of you have come, and I'm the only pastor you've known here. Some of you, this is your first church. Some of you are recent Christians. I want to tell you that Christianity is a beautiful journey. And the scriptures say that he develops us and you should never expect to be comfortable, but here's what you should rest in, the fact that God's got you in his loving hands. He may take you out of state. He may take you out of the country. He may move you all around. You may move out of Richmond. You may say, it doesn't matter. It's just the, the one thing you can take confidence in is that in all of the change of life, you are settled and steady in God's hand. Philippians 1.6 says, he that has begun a work in you will perform it until the day of Christ. And I want to encourage you, folks. No church is perfect. No person is perfect. But Christ is. He is immovable. He is immovable. Follow Christ. Follow Christ. Follow Christ. And you will be okay. And expect a wonderful journey. Sometimes God illuminates the entire path up the mountain for you, and you appreciate that, but sometimes he illuminates just the next turn. Still rest in him. I want to encourage you in particular, you new ones, you reflect the heart of this mission of this church. Stay. Don't leave this church. Support this church, all of you. Serve this church. Give to this church. Speak well of this church. Folks, I beg you, roll up your sleeves, recruit a couple people other around you, because this moment God is calling on all of us to serve this church, not to be served, but to be the church. Help this church. Pray for this church. Roll up your sleeves. Serve this church. Give to this church. Do not leave this church. Speak positively about this church and build and build and give God glory in this church. I remember, I believe it was the first month when I was here, I was on stage left preaching, I'll never forget, and I, I said the phrase, if I ever hear of anyone saying, well, Ben's gone, this church is just nothing, I said, I will haunt you in your dreams. Please don't make me uh, visit you. You honor the Lord by supporting a church that loves the gospel and will serve people in this way. Do not leave. Grow this church. Stay with this church. Serve this church. Support that next pastor and his family. Support them. Love them. Do all you can for them. If we continue to be a part of the supernatural joy from this day forward, conduct yourself with such a pure Christ-like intention. The world will see you. Philippians chapter 2, verse 14 and 15. Do everything without complaining or arguing so that no one can criticize you. That's the watching world, by the way. Build up this body. Don't tear it down. Don't gossip. Don't, don't. That's the worst cancer. It's the best tool of the evil one. Gossip's the way of the world. That's how you get ahead in the world. That's how you slander people. Or you, It's a tool of the prince and power of the air. Don't act like the world. Be different. Let this place be a gossip-free zone. Let it be full of edification and exaltation. How you know gossip is removed from your church? 
Proverbs 26.20 says that just like fire goes out without wood, quarrels disappear when gossip stops. As your shepherd, I ask you to support this church. Give it all you got. Love souls. Worry about missing out on souls, not just methods you miss. Serve Christ. Be different. Look at verse 15. So that no one will criticize you. Live clean and innocent lives as children of God, shining like bright lights in the world, full of a crooked and perverse people. There's a dark world out there, and you need Jesus. They need Jesus. If you have a loved one that is away from the Lord and has moved away from you, I can tell you you have one prayer request. You pray that if something happens in their life that stirs their emotions so that they begin to think back to their roots and say, you know, I I always saw churches talking about relying on God and forgiveness and stuff. And, and, And if you have a loved one that's away from the Lord, you just pray that someday when that loved one gives God just one more chance, you just pray whatever church is in their vicinity that that particular Sunday Every single person would be the friendliest person to greet them. Every person would show the love of Christ. No one would ignore them. They all would be committed to the mission and vision. And they would sit down, and when they listened to the pastor, that day the pastor would share this beautiful truth of the gospel and that they would be saved and that they would love on his or her soul. There are people coming through Richmond every day of the week. Grove needs to be that haven that light that shines bright in the world for someone's loved one who's going to walk in these doors and give God one shot. Be that church. I would encourage you that there is one way in which to make sure you are focused on the right things is to evangelize. Evangelize. Preach the gospel. Preach the gospel. Verse 16 of Philippians 2. Hold firmly to the word of life. Hold firmly to the word of life. People are hurting. They need Jesus. They need his truth. They need it delivered to them by somebody that loves their soul deeply. They want to know if your Jesus can really meet their needs where they're at. If they can really be forgiven of their sin. If they can really be washed whiter than the snow. If there's something real that they can rely upon for the rest of their lives. What guests have experienced at Grove is alive and well here. And we must make sure that the blessing of the Holy Spirit of the living God never departs this place. And as long as you hold firmly the word of life to them, this will be a place that God can change lives. Hold firmly to the word of life. Then on the day of Christ's return, Paul says, I will be proud that I did not run in the race in vain and that my work was not useless with you. Grove is able to build now. And I ask you to support the next man of God and his wife and his family. Love on his family like you have loved on our family. Encourage them not just by words, but supporting the ministry. Pray for them. Serve the church. Give. Fight the temptation to be comfortable. Tell them you're going to be open to be stretched. Tell them you will join with him to do whatever it takes to fulfill the mission because it's the great commission. Tell them you'll be a useful vessel that the master of the house can use. And not just an earthen vessel that leaks and cracks and seeps all over the house, but that you will focus and be a useful vessel. And that you will pray for the strength of the church and you will pray for the revival of this church. And that you will pray that it is a healthy church before they even come. We've been through a lot. Remember COVID? 
don't remind me. The absolute hardest experience in my whole professional career, same with you. Two and a half months after coming to this church, the most common place that I spent in this dark, shut-down building was right at that top step. And I just prayed for you by name. Prayed that the Lord would sustain you and keep you. Tammy and I love this church, and you are our precious family. I imagine because of the strong relationships we have made, we will stay in touch, and I hope we do. I covenant to pray for this church and its success. And yes, you may find me in the months and years to come around here having breakfast or lunch with, in fact, you probably already know my favorite breakfast place, with friends of Grove. But don't worry, because I will never speak ill of this church. I will never say a cross word about this church. All my words will be edifying, will be God-glorifying. So if you see us, come on over nothing to hide. I will never, I may have friends over at our house. Some of you, we all may just have fellowship together, but you know what we're going to do? We're just going to enjoy fellowship. We're not going to gather in homes and talk bad about the church. I am praying for the church. I want the church to thrive and edify. So if you hear us talking, it'll be good, edifying, god glorying conversation because that's what the Lord would have. And I am rooting for this church that we have given almost four years of our lives to. It has been my highest honor to be your pastor. It has been my highest honor to be your leadership. It has been a pure honor for Tammy to be able to serve you as your lead servants. Now, make us proud. Take the baton now. Run the race with renewed energy. Make God proud. Just as a father wants his children to exceed them in all things, now seek the Lord, accomplish through his power greater things in these coming years than we could have ever of dreamed. Build tall. Build wide. Make God famous. And let us know that we did not run the race in vain these last four years, and our work was not useless. Grove, I love you. We love you deeply. Now go and make God proud. And whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do to the glory of Whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, Grove, finish it with me. Do it all to the glory of God. 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 God's way, God's way, God's way is the best way. Do it all to the glory. bow your heads. Some of you under the sound of my voice that have not accepted Christ, I encourage you, accept him today. Accept him today and get into this church and get around good spiritual people that will show you how to grow and mature and become a giant of the faith. Get around wonderful people that will point you to Christ. As your heads are bowed, Grove, commit today that you will do all, do all to the glory of God. That no syllable out of your mouth, no gathering or discussion, no thought or heart meditation will be focused on anything else except to God and his glory. Lord, you are good and your mercies endureth forever. God, I love these people so very much. Now, Lord, as a father who 
as with children, as Paul and his parental analogies, like a, a mother, him with his, her chicks, her chicks are, are, are just a child, a father, Lord, I just, just take care of them. And I know, I know, Lord, as long as they keep you first, you will grow and you will develop them and they will grow in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Protect them from the evil one. May they be in full confession constantly. And Lord, may great things happen in this place as Christ alone our hope is found. Lord, I pray the beautiful doxology. Now unto him who is able to do exceedingly, abundantly, above all that we ask or think, According to that power that works in us, glory in his church, now and forever. Receive great glory. May every heart cling to you. Lord, may every heart serve this church, give to this church, love this church, stay in this church, and may you reach the world from this church. We love you. We praise you this day. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? God be praised. If you just give us a moment, I'd love to introduce Matt Cobb to come. Good morning. Um, for those who don't know me, my name is Matt Cobb. I've been a member here for over 20 years. And I'm, the board I'm, a I'm on the board of directors of the church, and I'm the board representative today to kind of walk you through next steps, just very briefly. First, when I'm done in a couple minutes, we're gonna have an opportunity for folks to come down front, um, talk to Ben and Tammy, pray with them, thank them for their service here at Grove over the past four years, and for all that they've done here. We're gonna ask for you to pray for the church as we go through this time of transition and this time of change, and pray for Ben and Tammy and their family as they see God's will and for their next steps as well. I want to point us briefly to Hebrews 12. It's something God's kind of put on my heart this week. Therefore, since we also have such a large cloud of witnesses surrounding us, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us. Let us run with endurance the race that lies before us, keeping our eyes on Jesus the source and the perfecter of our faith, who for the joy that lay before him endured a cross and despised his shame and has sat down at the right hand of God's throne. Our purpose, our calling, is to glorify God and share the gospel. I encourage each of us, as we go this time of transition, to keep our eyes and our lives focused on Jesus. Let's run the race that lies before us, and not allow Satan to tear the church apart through division. Let us be focused on Jesus Christ. Now, there are a few things I need to talk about very briefly, the reasons I'm up here. Um, frankly, the last time, being here 20 years, I've been through a few pastor searches, um, never on this side of them. Um, and I'm realizing that I always had questions, what are the next steps, what's going to happen? And now I'm realizing I'd much prefer to be on the other side of that um, stage than here. But I want to kind of walk you through what the board is thinking at this point. First, uh, the board will be reaching out to the SBCV for assistance on identifying an interim pastor. Uh, next week, we're going to have Gordon Fort, who is an executive with the INB, International Mission Board, um, and a member of the board will, will be in the pulpit preaching. And that'll give us time to, to talk to SBCB and plan next steps. As a practical matter and as a business matter, uh, we've got a number of vacant board seats and we need to fill them. Um, and so as we go through this season of change at Grove, we'll be coming to you with names of people as we pray about them and talk with people about adding um, people who love Jesus and have a skill set to serve on the board to help us through this time of transition. And so you can expect us to come back to you um, over the coming weeks with, with different votes on different members to join the board. 
Um, but with Ben's resignation, we have an immediate need for at least one board member um, just to remain compliant with the bylaws and um, Virginia law. So next week, um, pursuant to Article 8, Section 3 of the bylaws of the church, we'll call a church meeting for the purpose of voting to add Daniel Borland to the board and to serve as treasurer of the church. Um, for those of you who, who don't know Daniel, um, Daniel and his wife Kimberly lead a small group here at Grove. They've been here for many years. They've got two wonderful kids, Jude and Autumn. Um, Daniel works at Genworth. He's an actuarial analytics. Is, in other words, he's a lot smarter than I am when it comes to, to numbers. Um, and it's frankly a skill set we need on the board as treasurer through this time period. Um, so this is the official notice that next week after the service we'll have a vote on Daniel Borland to join the board. And as I mentioned, there'll be additional board members needed over the coming weeks that we will be coming to you talk about. Once we get an interim pastor in place, we'll begin the process of, of looking at, okay, what does a search committee look like to try and find a new pastor for Grove? And, and we'll provide updates as we get through that process. But we need to get through the first steps of, of setting up an interim pastor, so just bear with us on that. I also want to acknowledge on behalf of the board that we are aware that there's a request from some members to review the financials of the church and other documentation of the corporation. Um, we're going to respond to those requests. We're working to be as transparent as possible. There will also be an opportunity in the near future to talk about the bylaws and revisions to the bylaws that may be appropriate. But I'm going to ask for a little bit of patience, give us a little bit of time to kind of work through the process of setting up a um, an interim pastor and getting things going that, that way. Finally, I just want to mention Grove is blessed to have a staff that loves Jesus in the church. They love each and every one of you. Um, and I'm sure, like you, many of them are now wondering about next steps. Uh, the board's going to meet with the staff tomorrow um, to talk to them about all of this and to minister to them through this time period. So we are going to take care of the staff and, and talk with them about all of this. I know this is a lot to kind of drop on everyone after Ben's announcement. I'll stick around for a few minutes if anyone has questions. But I'll make sure everyone has an opportunity to come down and thank Ben and Tammy. Pray with them. Show your appreciation, your love for them, for all they've done for Grove over the past four years. Um, but with that, let me close this in prayer if I could. Father God, we thank you, Lord, for sending Jesus to die for us. God, we thank you for putting us here on this earth to glorify you, to share the gospel, um, to show others your love, Lord God. We just pray for Ben and Tammy and the girls um, as you are leading them away from Grove, Lord God, that you just make clear what their path is and what you have planned for them, Lord God. We thank them for their service, God. I pray for Grove, God, for the membership, Lord, that we just keep our eyes focused on you, that we run the race, Lord God, with our eyes on you. God, that we glorify you in all of our conversations, and we look forward to what you are going to build on this foundation, Father God. We thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.